Hello, everyone. I'm Keith Stone with the Center for Hellenic Studies, and this is the Cosmos Society's online open house series. Uh, we're here today with Dr. Maria Zanthu, who has her PhD from the Aristotle uh, University of Thessaloniki. She teaches Greek and Latin literature, sorry, Greek literature and language at the University of Leeds, and she's a research associate at the Center for Hellenic Studies. She's here today to talk with us about High and Low, Xerxes' Desire for Thessalian Heights and Tembe Gorge. Maria? Thank you very much, Keith. Um, the reason for choosing this uh, uh, title and this topic has to do, I think, uh, it's manifold. First of all, it's uh, of course, related to your um, metier or to what you as an expert of uh, ancient Jewish uh, literature. It is also related with uh, my experience uh, since I come from this particular area and uh, I usually travel and see Mount Olympus very often. And also because um, when I read this particular passage that I'm going to present you, uh, it um, actually it compelled me to uh, do some research uh, about this and why uh, Xerxes felt this uh, desire. So I decided to pursue this topic further. Um, in ancient Jewish and Greek literature, as you know, mountains have always figured largely in, in literary and religious imaginary and often in religious practice. Take, for example, the Greek god who supposedly lived on Mount Olympus or Mount Sinai, one of the most important sacred places in Abrahamic religions, where Moses re received laws from God or the mountain of Ararat, of the book of Genesis, which do not refer specifically Mount Ararat, but it, ha but it has been widely accepted as a resting place of Noah's Ark. Critical scholars generally agree that the biblical motif of holy mountain, on which the supreme God dwells, is well known from ancient Mediterranean and Near Eastern cultures, for instance, Egypt, Greece, and Mesopotamia. Contested feature of mountains related to religious practice, as mentioned earlier, is their role as locations for sanctuaries of the gods. However, let us not be mistaken that a mountain is not the same as an acropolis. And by acropolis, we usually mean that fortified height or hilltop, often identified with the religious center and symbol of political power within the city. Now, what is a mountain? What's the definition of a mountain? A mountain is a highly elevated landform stretching above the surrounding land in a limited area, usually in the form of a peak, a height outside inhabited and cultivated space. This means outside the polis, the astu, the town and the villages. But still, height forms only part of its features. A mountain is often defined by its wilderness. And uh, in the Old Testament, as Keith knows very well, usually mountains are combined with wilderness. And as a result, is contrasted to the area of cultivation. Due to their less hospitable terrain and climate, mountains tend to be used less for agriculture and more for resource extraction and nowadays for recreation. Olympus is considered the highest mountain in Greece, as you can see in our next slide, regarding as the eternal home of the Olympian god and according to Homer, the seat of Zeus. Altitude overlooking all of its surroundings creates a powerful impression as do its massive size and density in its dramatic ascent, especially at the east and west, which is hardly obscured by any foothills. So there are no foothills uh, in the nearby area. It rises steeply, as you can see, from a base measuring some 20 kilometers in diameter to a ridge some two to 2,400 meters in elevation, with the summit region in the north capped by limestone. And this is the limestone that you can see. 
It forms a steep ridge from the northwest to the southeast with numerous peaks, the highest point located approximately in the middle at what has been called Mitika's Peak. The northernmost peak uh, was formerly believed to be the highest. Although snow remains until well into summer, Olympus does not have a permanent snow cover like, for example, Mount Everest or the Zagros Mountains. An ancient sacrificial site was excavated at an altitude of some 2,900 meters on the easily accessible peak of St. Anthony's. And the thing is, the most important is how do all this relate with Herodotus' histories and especially with Xerxes? Chapters 128 to 130, these are handouts number one, two, and three in your handout of the seventh book in Herodotian histories, form a very special, though not unusual, digression. First, I'll provide you with some narrative background. Upon arriving to Therma on his way south, Xerxes establishes his army in the land extending from the city of Therma and Mygdonia as far as the rivers Lydias and the Haliakmon, which serve as the natural boundaries between the lands of Botiaea and Macedonia. In the midst of other proceedings, he also meets with the heralds he sent in advance to demand, as you all know, the subjection of other Hellenic city-states, except Athens and Sparta. And you already know that the omission of these two states was due to the shameful treatment given in the past to the heralds whom Darius sent on the same business. Defining the extent of the land occupied, by Xerxes' army, Herodotus informs his audience that when Xerxes saw from Therma, uh, maybe we can move on to the next um, image. Um, uh, can you read, uh, Sarah, can you read this passage for us? When Xerxes saw from Therma the very great height. When Xerxes saw from Therma, the very great height of the Thessalian mountains, Olympus and Ossa, and learned that the Peneus flows through them in a narrow pass, which was the way that led into Thessaly, he desired to view the mouth of the Peneus, because he intended to march by the upper road through the highland people of Macedonia to the country of the Perabi and the town of Gonus. Mm -hmm. I would like you to have a look at this particular image, this photo. This I tried in a way to recreate. I gave some instructions to um, the photographer who, who took these uh, photos. Um, I wouldn't say that it, this is the exact place where Xerxes uh, stood, but believe me, it gives you a very close resemblance of what Xerxes saw because this photo was taken exactly from a foothill uh, where um, Xerxes probably stood and what you can see is on the right side you see Mount Olympus on the one hand you can see how um, high this mountain is on the other side right on your right side of uh, uh, the image you can see mountain ossa you can see that it is also capped with snow can you can you see that and somewhere in the middle you will see that a uh, well, the mountains try in a way to um, connect, but there is something like a mist in between them. This is exactly where Tempe Gorge is. Uh, the sea that, you, that you're actually watching uh, in this image is the sea of the Thermaic Gulf. It was used during World War I by the British fleet. And uh, of course, it was also used by Xerxes' naval fleet. 
Now, many who have visited the vast area of Mountain Olympus and Tempe Vale, and having performed, as I've already mentioned, my part of Herodotian autopsy, I count among them, can attest the validity of how well this piece of information that there are three roads from, from Lower Macedonia into Thessaly. Now, in this image, you see the first road east of mountain olympus along the coast and here you can see the coast of pieria along the long valley um, the coast to the mouth of pineus and up the river through the pass of uh, the tempe maybe we can uh, move on to the next images Yes, you can here you can see well here you see this is the west side of the Thermaic Gulf. In the previous picture, we were on the east side of the Thermaic Gulf, facing the west, whereas now our direction is from south to north, and we are on the west side of the Thermaic Gulf. And here is uh, the valley, not the Tempe Gorge but the valley of uh, Pieria. Uh, can we move on to the next uh, image? Now, here is the Tempe Gort, is where the, um, the clouds are, and where you can see the mist. And this is the road that leads to the town, to the Thessalian city of Larissa, exactly to the village of Gonus and uh, it is uh, and right through uh, the Tempe Gorge and by the way you can see uh, the Goni uh, village it is right on your left side uh, or you can see these white houses uh, on the uh, uh, left side exactly where uh, Sarah points with the cursor now, th uh, the next uh, road is through the depression between Western Olympus and the Pieran Hills called the Pass of Petra, leading to the sources of the river Europus or Titaresius and down that river through Perebia. And then the third road, making a lo much longer circuit around the mountains up the valley of the Haliacmon and then turning southeast through a deep cleft in the Cambunian mountains to the upper valley of the Titaresius. Now back to the chapters 128 to 130 and why they constitute a special digression. Uh, chapter 128, which Sarah, which Sarah uh, read, begins with an expression of a desire. This is uh, handout number one. Leaving his army at place in Therma, Xerxes embarks on a Sidonian ship heading towards the area. As soon as he arrives, he views the mouth of Pineus and the gorge of Tempe and asks his guides if it were possible to turn the river from its course and lead it into the sea by another way. In the next chapter, this is chapter 129, uh, can you, uh, Sarah, can you read uh, passage 20, 129 from our handout? Uh, is this the one when Xerxes saw when Xerxes banner? Uh, this is, um, I don't have the, the handout in front of me. Give me one sec, sorry. It's the one that yes. begins Thessaly. Apologies, I'll be with you in a sec. Close the document, I beg your pardon. Maria, we have a question on the YouTube, maybe you can answer. Yes. Uh, I've yes. it on the site, thank you. Uh, so, uh, can you read the... Uh, sure, yes. sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, what is the Hershey's name in the Old Testament? 
and uh, somebody said maybe it's uh, how serious so you, I think I, I'm not an expert in Old Testament I think Keith can help us well <laughs> with this yes that's right that's right exactly thank you okay so I'm, I'm sorry I now have the reading open uh, Thessaly as tradition has it was in old times a lake enclosed all round by high mountains. On its eastern side, it is fenced in by the joining of the lower parts of the mountains Pelion and Ossa, to the north by Olympus, to the west by Pindus, towards the south and the southerly wind by Othris. In the middle then of this ring of mountains lies the Vale of Thessaly. A number of rivers pour into this vale the most notable of which are Peneus, Apidanus, Onochonus, Anipeus, Pamismus. These five, while they flow towards their meeting place from the mountains which surround Thessaly, have their several names until their waters all unite and issue into the sea by one narrow passage. As soon as they are united, the name of the Peneus prevails, making the rest nameless. In ancient days, it is said, there was not yet this channel and outfall, but those rivers and the Bourbon Lake, which was not yet named, had the same volume of water as now, and thereby turned all Thessaly into a sea. Now, the Thessalians say that Poseidon made the passage by which the Peneus flows. This is reasonable, for whoever believes that Poseidon is the shaker of the earth and that rifts made by earthquakes are the work of that god, will conclude upon seeing that passage that it is of Poseidon's making. It was manifest to me that it must have been an earthquake which forced the mountains apart. Thank you very much. So, as you realize, Herodotus makes a digression from the narrative and discusses the setting of the Salian Vale in great detail, providing some historical perspective on the formation of the geographical terrain. So, to, just to sum up, according to his account, Thess Thessaly used to be a lake enclosed all round by high mountains, fencing by the joint lower part of mountains Pelion and Osa, as we heard from Sarah's reading on the east, by Olympus to the north, by the range of Pindus to the west, and by Orthris to the south. He names the rivers that pour into the vale, namely Pineus, Apidanos, Onochonus, Enipeus and Pamisos, which ultimately unite into one. Remember, uh, we heard from Sarah saying that the name of Pineus prevails. Now, according to Herodotus' account, in prehistoric times, the gorge of Tempe did not exist, but all five rivers and the Lake Boibias had the same volume of water and hence turned all Thessaly into a sea. He also cites the Thessalian version for the formation of the Tempe Gorgia, which was followed much later by Pliny the Elder in his Historia Naturalis. According to Herodotus, this, the Tempe Gorge was created by an earthquake which forced the two mountains, Olympus and Osa, apart. In chapter 130, this is number three of your handout, Xerxes asks the guides about another outlet for Pineus into the sea and about, upon receiving a negative answer, Xerxes reaches to a conclusion about the Alewade uh, rulers of the Thessalians to surrender early on and to send messengers inviting Xerxes to invade Greece. What is intriguing in these three chapters is the interplay among motivation, sensory engagement, autopsy, mind reading and etiology as the principal constituents of what we call Herodotian enacted inquiry. Now, chapter 128 is full of sensory stimuli. To give you an example, Herodotus reports that what sparks Xerxes' interest and consequent inspection of the Tempe Gorge is his gazing at Mountain Olympus and Mountain Ossa. 
In fact, although sight seems to take precedence over other senses in this passage, is not the only one involved in it. No sooner than Xerxes gaze uh, does Xerxes gaze at the Thessalian mountains than he asks to hear or better learn through hearing, because this is what the construction of punthanomai, cum accusativo, and et infinitivo means, that there is a glen between these two mountains, and Peneus, the river Peneus, flows through them. It is important for his inquiry, in general for Herodotian inquiry, which responds to his sensory engagement with the excessive height of the two Thessalian mountains. It is Xerxes' gaze which prompts him to embark on his enacted inquiry in the same way Herodotus defines it, namely involving selection, uh, discrimination and research into disparate source material. However, it is through hearing that Xerxes receives the first information about the geography of the Tempe, Gorgi and the Thessalian plain. The combination of seeing and hearing, uh, and this is expressed by the two participles uh, Horeon and Akuon, results to Xerxes' des desire to sail and take a look at Pethumese Plosas Theasastai, the river's mouth, which Macan believes that has many meanings and must he here cover not merely the mouth, but the whole Tempe Gorge. He, on his desire, Hos de Epithumese, Xerxes embarks on the boat he regularly used for such purposes, and he bids the rest of his fleet accompany him. On arriving at his destination and gazing on the river's mouth, Xerxes is overwhelmed with wonder and thomati megalo enesheto at the Pineus and asks his guide if it is possible to divert it and lead it into the sea at some other point. Xerxes' query prompts the historian to interrupt his narrative to discuss at length the story that Thessaly was once a vast sea, the one that Sarah read to us, before the Pineus drained into the Aegean. After this digression, Herodotus resumes his narrative and reports that in response to Xerxes' question, the guards replied that there was no other outlet. Upon hearing this, Xerxes speculated that Thessaly could easily be placed underwater by damming and diverting the river and inferred that uh, it was because of this possibility that the Thessalians had come to terms with, it, with him. When Macan commented on the same passage, he noted that, and I quote, for Xerxes, his views, his inquiries, his visit to the scene, his researches, his theories, his criticism, one is tempted to substitute Herodotus himself. In this episode, like in others involving kingly inquiry, like for example, the king of Ammonians and Terhos's inquiry into the source of the Nile, or Darius's inquiry into the what uh, point the Indus River uh, enters the sea, or Darius's visit to Darius exploration of the Thracian river Terus, the identities of the king and the historian are blurred and almost amal amalgamated. However, this amalgamation hardly conceals the dynamics of emulation between one or any king on the one hand and the historian himself on the other. Never not undermined, it is certainly uh, abandoned and disrupted at the end of any digression. In many ways, the agenda of Xerxes' expedition to Tembe Gorgia, as well as Herodotus's, uh, seem to virtually coincide. At first, Xerxes appears performing an enacted inquiry in the like of Herodotus, as he acts like a conscientious collector and moderator of information through human senses and faculties, like for example sight, speaking and listening. And I refer to the exact uh, participles Horon, Penthanomenos and Akuon. In fact, Herodotus presents Xerxes with an excellent coordination of senses as he firstly sees 
the focus of his exploration from afar. Then he asked his guides to learn about it. So he asked for oral information and he listens to it. Finally, he received the received information results to his visiting the site and to performing his own autopsy, which is a combination and coordination of senses. So the more oral information he receives, the more his interest in viewing a site grows and persists. He uses the same ship that he employed whenever he wished to do such a thing. Though, as I said earlier, that his faculty of sight sparks his inquiry, it is the coordination of all three senses that sparks his desire to visit the Gorgon. What is distinct in his sightseeing expedition is its grand scale, as it involves his entire fleet. Herodotus stresses Xerxes' reaction as the outcome of his expedition. He marveled greatly and, uh, at the Gorgia and Thomate, Megalo, and Eschieto. And I would like to dwell on Herodotus' use of the noun Thoma or Thauma in this context. Inasmuch as Thoma outlines the result of Xerxes' inquiry, it is supported by the sensory interconnection between sight and other senses. Such sensory interconnection between sight and other sense are important for Herodotian inquiry as well. In the case of vision, ancient philosophers emphasized the supposed capacity to see even those uh, stimuli that outwardly seem to appeal to the other senses. This idea can be traced back to Plato and Aristotle and to the quality of what came to be late, be labeled as energeia or visual vividness. This, according to my view, is one semantic aspect of the Herodotian use of Thoma. The other one is related to the Herodotian proem. Proem of Herodotus's histories features a dual programmatic concern with human activities or actions. Uh, the exact phrase is ta genomena ex anthropon and works or achievements as the finished product of human activity. The exact Greek word is erga. Ever since Imervar carried further Regenbogen's interpretation of erga and expanded its lexical content to include not only past achievements, but also things worthy of remembrance, we have come to think of Herodotus' preoccupation with things or objects, whether natural or man-made, uh, the exact Greek phrasing is erga megalate kai thomasta, is one of the major principles underpinning his historiographical method. In that sense, things or objects act as signifiers that bear meaning, deliver messages, invite inter interpretation, and elicit the reactions of their recipients. Along these lines, the Herodotian user of Thoma evokes his proem and is fully aligned with his programmatic statement through the amalgamation of the capacity of the king inquirer and that of the historiographer. However, from this point onwards, this amalgamation start to dissolve. Xerxes' wonder at the Peneus takes, moreover, a peculiar turn, and I will explain. He immediately asks if there is any other outlet through which it might flow to the sea. Due to the historian's intrusion in the narrative with his own digression on the question, it is the passage that Sarah read to us, one might suppose that Xerxes, like Herodotus, is intrigued by the geological history of the region. When the narrative resumes, it becomes clear that Xerxes' interests are more practical. His interest, he's interested in the strategic implications or practicalities of the Pineus' situation. His initial query is form, veils this interest. In other words, it is one thing what he asks and another what he implies or means.
He asked his guides about the possibility of diverting the river and leading it out into the sea elsewhere, whereas his real, or if you like, ultimate interest lies in the fact that one may dam it up and divert it back onto the Thessalian plain. This is number three in your handout. The speculative stance about the possible diversion of the Peneus points toward the peculiar outlook of an autocrat. If the diversion implied by Xerxes were executed, and it is only the surrender of the Thessalians that prevents this from happening, this would constitute not only a destructive reversal of the geological history in which the historian is interested, but also an arrogant interference with nature reminiscent of Xerxes' digging of the channel through mountain Athos. At this point, I would like to illustrate further how Herodotus gradually distances himself from what I call the amalgamation of the king as inquirer and the historian. Classical scholars like Matthew Christ, Rosalind Thomas, Nino Luraghi and Egbert Bakker, whose terminology I borrowed uh, about the uh, Herodotus' inquiry, emphasized the importance of empirical method in Herodotian historiography. Empirical method, if interpreted as enactment, and this is exactly Egbert Bakker's terminology, uh, of an inquiry involving selection, discrimination, and research into disparate source material has an inherently dialogic nature. Historia, in the sense of seeking for an idea, is an act of negotiation insofar as Kronos time sets an inextricable limitation on the search by affecting data and rendering remote events impossible to recover. Based on this limitation imposed by time upon the search of AI, the discriminating investigator is inviting to, re to reject or accept different opinions or contradicting one another and ultimately to form his or her own opinion. Herodotus' empirical inquiry is his means of navigating through the heterogeneity of traditions about different times and spaces is to integrate these traditions within a specific narrative, a logos, as Herodotus calls, uh, calls it, and to organize time and space as the basic dimensions of uh, recording. In chapter 299.1, and I would like to ask Sarah to read this uh, for us, up to that point, my own observation, as well as my judgment and my inquiry, are at the basis of what is said. But from now on, I will be presenting Egyptian accounts as I heard them. Still, there will be an element of personal observation in it. So in this chapter, as you see, Herodotus contrasts historia as critical listening, along with opsis, seeing, and gnome, opinion, to the more passive reception of accounts, logoi, as he heard them. Historia, then, seems to be looking through the eyes of one's informants and making up for their imperfect point of view by the power of judgment and discrimination. Needless to say, Historia is the interrogation of specially selected informants and aims at providing proving or disapproving their view of the truth. And chapters 128 to 130 exemplify this method. Focus on special features of landscapes and objects underpins his overarching empirical method, thus illustrating the meaning of the phrase historias apodexis as the product of inquiry enacted through autopsy. In other words, it involves critical examination of the opinion of those who have seen, which results in the conflicting accounts of works, achievements, 
as signs, I quote, by which the existence of the players in the historical process can be remembered. Besides the sensory agenda and its relation to his historiographical method, Herodotus is focused on the description of the mountainous terrain of Macedonia and Thessalia, reveals another aspect of his method. The intertextuality of Herodotian text. And this is another aspect of the Herodotian text I would like to draw your attention. As mentioned earlier, both regions are defined by mountains and large river and lake systems acting as physical boundaries and providing mountain as well as river routes for communication. In this sense, Herodotus' preoccupation with the description of Macedonian and Thessalian mountains could be easily explained away as serving the, what we may call the logistics and root of the Persian army. However, a close reading of the passage reveals Herodotus's interaction with Homer and Hesiod as sources of geography of these regions, as his text echoes Homeric and Hesiodic parallels. I will start by referring to Pindar's third Pythian ode, which provides us with the earliest extant full accounts of Apollo's love affair with a young girl named Coronis, the daughter of King Phlegias, a Lapis king, the others being the account as cited in the Hesiodic catalogue of number seven of your handout, and I would like to ask Sarah to read this for us. At that time, a messenger came a raven from the holy feast to sacred Pitho and reported unseen deeds to unshorn Phoebus that Ischis had slept with Coronus. He, Elatus' son, her, the daughter of Zeus-born Phlegias. Um, I'm going both. Yes. And, and, oh, yeah. and the hymn of Asclepius, the healer of sicknesses, first I sing, son of Apollo born in the Dotian plain to the Lady Coronis, daughter of King Phlegias. In both accounts, both the Hesiodic and the Homeric, Coronis is also designated with the standard reference, the daughter of Phlegias. A second piece of information that we can extrapolate and is linked with Coronis is that she lives in La Kerea, a city situated at the banks of Lake Boibias. We, I mentioned Lake Boibias earlier. Pindar offers exact information on the girl's dwelling, which used to be La Kerea, situated on the northwestern summit of the double hill arising out of the Docius campus, a plain in Pelasiotis in uh, Thessaly, situated south of Ossa, bank of Lake Boibias. Lake Boibias also features in fragment 59, uh, whose association with the Coronis uh, Ehoia ha has been challenged by West. There are many verbal coincidences regarding the description of Coronis in the Hesiodic text as preserved in Papyrus Oxyrhynchus and other authors. Parallels between fragments 59, the Hesiodic uh, uh, fragments, and Pythian 3, uh, you can uh, see exactly the um, uh, the parallels that I have uh, that I have included in the handout. Lake Boy Boys is the linking point among the Herodotian, Homeric, and Hesiodic text. In Homer's Iliad, Book 2, and uh, verse 7, 11, the lake is also mentioned in the catalogue of ships, as we will soon hear in a Sarah's reading. And they that dwelt in Therai, be beside Lake Boibis, and in Boibi, and in Glafure, and well-built Iolcus, these were led by the dear son of Admetus, with eleven ships, even by Eumenus, whom Alcestis, queenly among women, bare to Admetus, even she, the comeliest of the daughters of Peleus. In antiquity, Lake Boy Base 
was considered the remnant of an island sea that originally covered the whole of Thessaly. And the lake could still be seen at the start of the 20th century with a depth of up to six meters. To wrap up, in today's presentation, I explored the interaction of geography and narrative and the possibly latent substitution of Xerxes by Herodotus. I have tried to tackle Herodotus' need to describe in detail the physical features of Tempe Gorgia as one of the most important geographical features of Thessaly and uncover the link between his description and his narrative of the progress of Xerxes' army. I have also investigated the reason for launching the description of Olympus and Ossa as the highest Thessalian mountains. And as I have explained, Herodotus initially attributes it to Xerxes' desire to see the Vale of Tempe, which was sparked by the very great height of these mountains, but the implications are far more intricate and more hardwired in his programmatic concerns as stated in his poem. David uh, asserts, and I quote, active commemoration by physical constructions is a foregone conclusion. My aim was to show how Herodotus' use of objects, erga, complies with his investigative an empirical method of inquiry conducted in order to secure the kleos, a notion very familiar to us, that counters the destructive force of time. What is at stake in the histories is the commemorative and material resilience of objects challenged by the, con the contrasting concepts of contingency, mutability, versus durability permanence. Natural or man-made objects may endure the passage of time or undergo change in their functions and meanings. All in all, Herodotus's methodological reliance on material artifacts, uh, natural um, phenomena and monuments chimes with his concept of historia, this critical interrogation of informants, in contrast to mere autopsy, opsis, allowing the exercise of personal judgment, gnome, that aims to prove or disprove their view of truth. So that will be all, and I would like, I think we have enough time for uh, discussion. Thank you, Maria. Yes, any questions? I can go if no one else has one. I got one too. Bill. Um, Maria, that was wonderful. I really enjoyed your insights, very much appreciated them. So I had questions about signifiers, one absence and one present. Mm -hmm. um, many of the uh, hymns to Apollo make uh, a big thing out of the veil of the temp as being the most beautiful valley in the world in those days mm -hmm. and i am surprised that that is not mentioned in xerxes interest in seeing the valley is that mm -hmm. Herodotus not using that kind of reference or is there some significance to the absence of that comment uh, you mean about how beautiful this uh, this valley is yes i would have thought that would have yes, um, the, the, this is an omission, but I think in a way, um, his um, Herodotus's focus of how the valley was formed, in a way, covers this gap that you mentioned. Okay. I mean, the, the fact that what we heard from uh, Sarah when she read to us this wonderful passage about how, you know, we have many rivers. Um, this is very beautiful. I mean, you ha we have many rivers coming from 
different geographical uh, parts of Macedonia and Thessaly, and they gradually flow into one, becoming one, like Pineos. And also, he uh, gives special emphasis of how the valley was formed, and he gives some somehow his own interpretation. He believes that an earthquake uh, took place. So, um, this is uh, what you say is really a very wonderful comment. It is a gap, but I think that the emphasis he places, he lays in the formation covers for this, uh, for this gap. Okay. So, I had a question about what I see as a signifier in, in the first, very first part of the readings. Uh, in uh, Num reading number two, uh, yes. paragraph number two, it names all the rivers that flow into the Peneus, mm -hmm. which it's kind of an extensive list. And to my memory, it's the same list as in, um, it's either the Homeric hymn to Apollo or uh, Kalmusk, um, in describing where Apollo and his sister were supposed to be born. You know, Hera was having various monsters and people chase them around. The Peneus offered to make that the birthplace. All the other rivers are named in that poem, and I find it interesting that they're named here again, as though to to hint at the, Paul, the Apollo's presence without actually saying it. I think this this is probably true. I haven't looked into it. I think it's it's a very insightful comment that you that you are making. It's very interesting how Herodotus, in a way, um, points his audience, his uh, his audience, first of all, and later his readers, towards his uh, what we may call Homeric sources of geography. And he likes, in a way, to streamline uh, or to connect or to link uh, his geographical data along with the um, uh, probably with with uh, what has been mentioned uh, in Homer, but I think I have to look more into it yeah. uh, because I must say that the uh, this is a factual uh, information that I'm giving you. Uh, the geo the geographical area of uh, what we call Macedonia and the land of Pereboi is really very complex. So far, many people discuss Greece from the point of the sea. And I think it is time uh, to consider mainland Greece and especially the mountains, how significant the mountains of Greece are and the mountainous terrain. And by mountainous terrain, I include both mountains as high peaks and also rivers that run along, uh, so forming this geographical terrain. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh. Yes. There's a question from YouTube. Um, which is the word most used by Herodotus for mountain? And what is the main difference between Oros and Bunos? Uh, Oros and Bunos. Oros usually is a, is, a, is a high, I think a very high mountain. Now, Bunos, I haven't looked into it. Uh, I'm just uh, saying this into intuition as and uh, as um, a reader of uh, Herodotus. Um, I haven't come across of I'm uh, come across of uh, Bunos. Um, Bunos may be. Uh, it is used in in modern modern Greek. It it's certainly related with high peaked uh, uh, mountains. As a, as a modern uh, as a modern speaker of of, of 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 Greek, I cannot tell the difference between Horus and Bu and uh, and Bunon, but uh, I assume that there must be uh, a difference. And it sounds like. Um, Horos is the one most used by Herodotus, you would say? Yes, Horos, definitely. Horos okay. is uh, definitely, and not only by Herodotus, also by, Husid by, by Thucydides. Okay, thank you.
Yes, Bunos is high ground, exactly, uh, as Jack says. Uh, Jack says, was uh, Herodotus setting out the vulnerability of Thessaly to protect the Thessalians from reprisal? Since Thessaly was indefensible, what else could the Thessalians do? Later on in Book 7, uh, Herodotus mentions the oath of the Greeks to punish Greeks who surrendered to the Persians without being forced to. This is 7.132. Yes, uh, well, this is true. Probably Herodotus, yes, was said vulnerability of Thessaly, but um, I think that this is, I, I thought about it as well. I think it, it's a more intricate matters, uh, matter why the Thessalians, um, in a way, uh, closed a pact with Xerxes. May I remind you also that the king of Macedonia, also, which was considered a satellite kingdom because it had excellent uh, links uh, with um, uh, Persia uh, at that time. Uh, also, you know, just the the Xerxes uh, army just went through the Macedonian uh, kingdom at that time. So I think the matter is uh, is more uh, more intricate. Probably Herodotus was forming a kind of um, I well not well identity I, I would say. So he tried in a way to anticipate uh, th uh, th or to justify Thessalians' uh, uh, de decision to to back uh, the, uh, the Xerxes' army and to close a pact. To reach an agreement. Could I ask Maria uh, where Lake Bibia was? I guess you said that it has disappeared in the meantime. Well, yes, it, it was exactly where the Thessalian plain is. If you now it uh, now it is drained. Oh, so very large, very large. Yeah, thing. it was very large, and it is probably. Um, uh, of course, uh, it drew its waters from uh, Pineus uh, uh, Mountain, and probably it was like a fossil lake from because the the Thessalian plain, uh, plain like thousands of years ago, used to be a sea. Okay, so there's something to that. Can you say more about Herodotus's public audience? A more general question about Herodotus. Uh, so, any so something more specific? What would you would you like me to say? Because I think there are so many things have been written about Herodotus's audience and how uh, his histories uh, were uh, uh, read uh, aloud and uh, how he composed and uh, I mean uh, this uh, public. Um, uh, reading of his uh, work and how I, I think Greg Naj, uh, spoke about uh, Herodotus's histories and how uh, they, uh, in a, in a way, shape our knowledge. Uh, about many things in ancient uh, literature, about the Homeric text, about the Panathenaic version of the Homeric text, and um, and how even uh, his own work was um, uh, shaped uh, by the uh, by the Homeric oral uh, recital. So um, I would say that uh, Herodotus is, is uh, uh, history is formed by uh, epic, by what we call nowadays Homeric uh, epic. Do we know what kind of occasion um, these readings might be part of? Were they dedicated to to readings of Herodotus? I th I think, Would it be think, at a symposium or? I think that first of all, uh, we we all know that Herodotus had, and I will come later to Anne's uh, question. I think knowing that uh, Herodotus 
had close links with the Athenian political elite. He would probably read his uh, work or one of his um, um, uh, companions or the people who help him uh, uh, write down his, uh, his text because we cannot speak about uh, oral performance in uh, in prose uh, probably in a close uh, in a very small circle of political friends because uh, may i remind you that and this is also partially answers Anne's um question i think that herodotus did have uh, an agenda uh, in many ways and um I think that Herodotus's notion of, object, of objective observer, as uh, Thucydides has taught us how to be or how to become, is very different. What Herodotus prompts us to do in his uh, Historia is what Egbert Bakker. Uh, explain to us is to enact an inquiry and to enact an inquiry means that we have to hear the best informants the best sources which is oh, by the way uh, a good advice for how to do journalism so to hear the best informants and then exercise gnome personal opinion about what is reliable. Um, so of course, Maria, one, were, one can were, say that, okay. Sorry. Uh, you, you were talking earlier though, yes. about uh, it, it, you almost using all the senses in some of the passages we were looking at. Mm -hmm. Herodotus is presenting Xerxes as also needing to see um, uh, and hear um, and and I, I wondered how much is of that is also important for his perception of it, how it, uh, it, 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 should be conducted. It, it is very important because these informants do not only say to him the logoi, and uh, by logoi I have explained that uh, the, this disparate versions of traditions, what they had heard and what they had learned. But they will tell him what they saw, what they smelled, what they heard. And Herodotus also um, would tell us also what he heard what he saw, uh, especially in, in his account of Egypt. So, yes, all senses take part in this enacted inquiry. Enacted inquiry is a sensorily enacted inquiry. It's all, not only um, in uh, a research into archives, but it's something that uh, what we may call living history or public history. Because history has many, uh, uh, has many meanings. History, for example, is what we live, uh, what we feel, what uh, as individuals are experiencing. I hope I answered your question, uh, Sarah. If I may, um, it's been too long since I read uh, uh, Oedipus at Colonus in with uh, Jeb's commentary, but I seem to recall that he had a note about uh, Herodotus being uh, Sophocles' friend, or Sophocles being Herodotus's friend. And there's a comment there about out of Oedipus's mouth about the 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 women in or uh, the daughters in Egypt and how they take care of their fathers mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, uh, I think there's a little bit of a uh, contrast there of about the um, 
the uh, the Greeks and the and the Egyptians as to you know how they uh, take care of the elderly, uh, and uh, th th there was uh, some note about how Herodotus delivered you know read at least parts of his book um, in Athens when he visited, and I recall that uh, there's a testimonium about Heraclitus reading his book in Athens. Uh, in the year 500. So there, evidently by the time Herodotus uh, comes along, uh, you know, after the Persian Wars, there was a, you know, a good tradition of authors uh, reading their books in, in, in public, like an acroesis. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I don't know whether they did so at the, uh, um, you know, in the theater or, or, or what, what the venue was, but uh, it, it seems like an interesting thing if there is a, a snippet somewhere that would tell us, you know, where, how, to, how to localize this. And I think your presentation today has just opened up a whole new world for me on how to read Herodotus, uh, you know, looking at the, uh, the geography he describes. It's, um, it's not just like uh, Xenophon's going so many parasangs, uh, you know, he's really uh, into the uh, specifics of, of, the, of, uh, of Greece and how uh, it uh, played in, you know, how it was a, f a factor in, in, the, uh, in the development of, of the war. And it, it's uh, the, the part leading up to the Battle of Salamis uh, is has become so much more interesting uh, for me after listening to you, Maria. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I must uh, I must admit that my own uh, let's say I, I started to to look into this topic uh, even from my own uh, sensory um, um, understanding of the landscape because as I told you I. I come from this particular area and I, uh, I usually travel and I see Mount Olympus and especially in Herodotus we have so many uh, information about uh, how, about the exact route of Xerxes' army, uh, although sometimes we cannot uh, exactly identify the exact route, but still we have a bulk of information that still we haven't deciphered. And it is very interesting to look into this topic in order to understand not only the factual data, and I mean how, uh, what, what, to pin down the exact route of the Xerxes army, but also to understand what Anne Spendiff uh, said about the agenda, Herodotus' agenda, and it is not only the historical agenda, it is the, ge the geographical ag agenda. What uh, compels Herodotus to tell us how uh, the, the Tempe Gorgi formed? Um, I will just mention one um, uh, very uh, interesting question. Uh, that I received from a very good colleague at the University of Haifa at the Israel Society for the Promotion of Classical Studies. For example, he asked me, so why did, uh, would it be possible for Xerxes to be really uh, impressed by uh, Olympus when, for example, you have Zagros, Mount Zagros in Mesopotamia? Okay, but I think I replied to him what is really interesting is to examine this particular passage not only for Xerxes' point, but to ask ourselves what compels Herodotus to present Xerxes as being impressed by uh, uh, mountain Olympus's, uh, uh, by, by mountain uh, Olympus. Yes, uh, I think that, uh, yes, uh, Bill, thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. That's a good spot, I suppose, to end. Uh, thank you very much for your hospitality.
We're always glad to have you. Usually you're in the audience of these of these open houses, but it's good to have you speaking here today. Well, one, one last comment from Anne. If the oops, I lost it. If the geographical detail is reliable, even today, might that suggest that everything else is reliable too in Herodotus? Um yes, in a way. For example, Lake Boibias doesn't exist anymore. So we cannot see this lake in its full glory. But uh, certainly we, the Tempe Gorgi are there and also uh, Gonoi as a small village still exists, although it is the ancient site and the new village of Gonoi. And uh, I think that uh, an autopsy really were worthwhile. Great, all right. Thanks everyone. See you next time.